You are listening to the Maddox Podcast, hosted by the Maddox Real Estate Team. Jason Maddox, Jamie Abitia, and Katrina Pryor, presented by Painless Podcast. To learn more about our services, check out our website at maddoxrealestate.com. The city of Napa was founded over 170 years ago. Since then, it has grown into the epicenter of winemaking in North America and become one of the must-see travel destinations, not just to Bay Area locals, but for most people around the world. But why Napa? How did this tiny settlement grow into one of the great wine capitals of the world? Today, the Maddox team is joined by the Napa Historical Society's Dawn Winter to talk about how Napa and the Napa Valley became the winemaking hub it is today and what makes it such a great vacation destination. Welcome, Dawn, to episode five of the Maddox podcast. Uh, we're really excited about this opportunity here. This is our first, po- first podcast episode of 2021. So here we are, Maddox podcast. We've made no secret how much we love wine, going wine tasting, and of course, making our way up to the Napa Valley, um, one of the most beautiful places, probably not just in the United States, but in the world. And today we thought it would be a really fun idea to dive into the history of Napa. Yeah, we talk about wine, but let's really take a deeper dive into the history and learn how it became the wine capital of America. So today our first podcast guest is Don Winters of the Napa Historical Society. Don, thank you so much for being here. I know we have so much to learn from you and we cannot wait to, to really dive deep into this. So first we'd love to for you to tell us about your background Um, and how you became involved with the Napa Historical Society. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, and we can't wait to welcome all of you and your listeners to historic Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a global hotel and restaurant advisor, and I've been doing that for 47 years. In fact, I did my first assignments in the Napa Valley in 1973, a couple of them. Um, I moved to Napa in 2000 and we spent a lot of time here. Uh, We ultimately in about 2010 sold our home in San Francisco and I began researching Napa uh, County hotels. There was so much more of a story that nobody knew about. So I started giving lectures to different groups up and down the valley and the Napa County Historical Society invited me for a presentation and then I joined their board and I've been on the board now for eight years. It's an unbelievable organization. And there's so many facets of Napa County beyond wine. We're very proud of the wine. It's a very, uh, very important part of our lives, but it's relatively new as far as being uh, an overwhelming brand identity of Napa County. So that's how I got on Napa County Historical Society board. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Would you mind sharing a little bit of the early history of Napa and maybe where it's founded, where the city name came from? Do you know much about that? Sure. Um, Well, first there were the the Native Americans, then the Spanish, and then uh, Mexico seceded from Spain. Uh, Nobody wanted to be in California. Uh, it was hard duty to, to be in California. As you know, we don't have many navigable rivers. We don't have many ports as opposed to the East Coast of the United States. Uh, the military didn't want to be assigned here. Uh, the wives didn't want to come. There was no trade. There was, there, there was nothing of interest. In fact, a lot of the early settlers in, in, in Alta, California, as it called, were constrict, conscripted uh, military people, people that didn't want to be here and were forced to be here. We had uh, we had uh, uh, Long Beach and the Port of La- Los Angeles, uh, Monterey Bay, which was a major part of California, and the San Francisco Harbor. Um, so our first in Napa County, uh, nobody lived here. Uh, the, the famous George C. Yount came in 1836, built his Kentucky blockhouse. But all the action was over in Sonoma, and my personal hero, General Mariana Guadalupe Vallejo, who was the most educated and elegant and principled gentleman in the entire state of what became California. Um, But what the Spanish and then the Mexicans did was raise cattle, and Napa County was just cattle grazing amongst the grizzly bears and the cougars and so on and so forth. So the 
Napa County had nothing going for it. Uh, Cayetano Juarez built an adobe in 1842, and Mariano Guadalupe's brother Salvador built an adobe in 1842. And I should say here for you history buffs uh, listening, it's much easier to be a California historian than anywhere else in the United States because our history is relatively new. Um, so our principal exports were hide and tallow steer hides and in fact there was no market for the beef so they would slaughter the cattle in the fields some of the native americans uh, benefited from that but basically the carcasses were left in the fields the the carcasses the hides the, the hides and the tallow were rendered and then they were shipped out of the napa river napa actually exists because we have a navigable river one of the few uh rivers in california petaluma river navigable is navigable Napa River, Stockton, and up to the Sacramento River. So you ask how it came to be named Napa. Uh, Nathan Coombs in 1857 uh, acquired the land from, from General Vallejo, laid out a little town because it was on the banks of the Napa River, exactly where the high tidewater uh, arises on the Napa River. Um, it was called Napa, as all sources seem to agree, by a Native American designation for the place. In fact, originally Napa was spelled with two P's. And in our historic Goodman Library building, we have a, a, just a wonderful large map where some do good or a hundred years ago crossed out the second P and it's highly visible thinking that it had never been Napa. It was actually N-A-P-P-A. -P -P -A. Wow. So it started, started 1857. Um, I find it fascinating, especially for my particular field of expertise, the lodging industry. The very first building in the city of Napa was a saloon. And it was called the Empire Saloon. Huh. And the very second building, and that was built in 1848 by Third Street, and in 1849, the second building in Napa was a hotel. And that hotel was attached to the saloon. It was called the Empire Hotel. So that's how we launched it. And because of the river and the fact that it was navigable and ships could come up, it, uh, other businesses started coming in. Um, as you know, the gold rush played a major part in the development of California. But Napa benefited because Many miners, uh, when the snows hit, uh, the gold country would come as far down as Napa and spend the winter. And they needed to be supplied and housed and fed and that sort of thing. So that kind of helped build the infrastructure of Napa City. Yeah, we were going to ask about, about the gold rush and the expansion. Um, you know, 1858 seems about the time that there, there really was uh, some growth uh, during the gold rush period. So is, that, is that accurate? Well, actually 1858 for Napa was the silver rush. We actually, and, and just for those who don't know, we always think of Napa as the wine country, but we were a major mining and mineral extraction and still are. Uh, resource in the entire country and in, in some cases the, the world. You, you all know that um, we extracted hundreds of millions of dollars of gold from Napa County. Uh, we had a huge bonanza of silver. And in wow. fact, there is a city now defunct in Napa County called Silverado City, halfway up the flanks of Mount St. Helena. And I have maps of it. They had, had a hotel. In fact, Robert Louis Stevenson, after that silver mine ran dry, uh, he married a widow from, not a widow, um, he ran away with a married woman from Oakland named Fanny, and they honeymooned in an ab abandoned miner's cabin on the side of Mount St. Helena. And he'd walk down uh, to the little hotel on the highway and uh, get his milk because he was a very sickly young man, but that's where he got started writing some of his famous novels. Silverado City, um, there were so many mining claims in the side of Mount St. Helena that it looked like fireflies dotting it. Every miner had a little claim and there were lanterns everywhere and, 
and that that uh, just took off. But a story we don't like to talk about very much is that Napa is one of the major sources of mercury in the entire world. Mercury uh -huh. only exists in some very rare places. Napa has to be uh, one of them. Uh, mercury exists where there are hot thermal springs and Napa is blessed with hot thermal springs. And uh, you go to Ahmed in Spain and uh, Xi'an in China. I was there. I, I asked uh, the professor at the famous tombs where all the mercury came from. He didn't know. And driving back to my hotel, I saw a billboard in English that talked about hot, hot springs. And that's wow. what happens. But uh, our economy in Napa uh, experienced some uh, booms in wartime because mercury is used in explosives. Uh, the local newspapers in Napa used to track the number of flasks that were exported from Napa every single day. So we're a big mineral producer. The other thing that nobody in public relations or tourism promotion talks about, we were also a major producer of asbestos. In wow. fact, I uncovered a resort hotel from way back that was uh, built right next door to a major asbestos mine. We also have coal petroleum, not much, but some. We have iron. And uh, beneath all these wonderful grapevines, there's a lot of other really cool stuff. So. Right. Are, are there uh, um, historic hotels that are still, still around that uh, people can visit and check out? The oldest operating hotel would be the Hotel St. Helena, and that's been around from the very beginning. That's a classic historic hotel. Uh, still in operation. We have remnants of some of the classics. Edna Springs uh, Resort, one of the great ones in, uh, uh, in actually in the West, Western United States of, of its time, ran for 99 consecutive years. Wow. Then it was sold, leased to the Moonies in the 1980s, and now it's fallen into disrepair, and a number of groups have acquired it and tried to uh, uh, restore it. It's a wonderful place in eastern Napa County. And in fact, um, most visitors to Napa County think of Napa Valley proper, but we have actually have 99 valleys in this in this county. We're only 788 square miles, but two thirds of the county uh, exists to the east of the Howell Mountain Range. And it's wild, rugged, beautiful, farmland, orchards, some vineyards, historic resorts, resort sites. And it's wonderful for cycling and hiking and, and bird watching and all of the amazing things. Many Nappans never go to right. that side of the valley, but, but it's a wonderful place. We have a couple of resorts and uh, the, the fabled Napa, uh, Napa Soda Springs Resort where several early presidents stayed. It was a, uh, one of the top uh, resorts in California. Uh, it's just, just up the hill from Silverado. In fact, the founder of uh, the early Silverado grounds granted right of way to Colonel Jackson who created the Na Napa Soda Springs Resort. In fact, that's how I really got started researching the entire history of the Napa County lodging industry when I had heard about this resort. And ultimately I got to know the owner of the grounds it was one of the most majestic, it's the most requested item at the Napa County Historical Society. When people ask about it, um, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a grand resort. In fact, many people don't know that Napa was once a yachting capital. Uh -huh. Our resort has silted in. And in fact, when uh, the America's Cup came to San Francisco, I recommended to the Napa Visitors Board uh, that that we promote when we became a sponsor, the fact that Napa, believe it or not, was a yachting capital. Huh. All the yacht clubs in the entire bay would organize regattas and sail up the deep Napa River and anchor uh, in downtown Napa and then take stagecoaches and carriages up to the fabled Napa Soda Springs Resort. So that was quite an undertaking. We do have a yachting heritage. So we wow. have mineral mining, we have uh, yachting, didn't know uh, that. We, we all talk about the winery. After, after we had trade and product, we went from hides and tallow exporting off the banks of Trancas, which means the bars where Salvador, that's where you can actually cross the Napa River. 
uh, and they'd be piled up there and little scows would take them down river to the to the uh, to the straits and then they'd be sent all over the, the world for processing. But then we became the wheat capital, the wheat capital of the United States of the Western United States. So the primary agricultural product of Napa County was wheat and related products, barley. We're a big barley producer. Uh, yes, we always had grapevines, but that was largely for immigrants who included table wines uh, with their with their family meals. Wow. None of the saloons, none of the hotels featured wine, which is really kind of astounding when you look yeah. at the last couple of day, uh, decades in, in Napa yeah. County. I mean, when you think of Napa, you think of wine, right? That's the that's the, the crazy part, and there's so much rich history that this information is so fantastic, and it's just going to make our experience. As we love this place so much, it's going to make our experience just, you know, soar because um, knowing these things going into it. And now, oh, um, and and I, I was told that you you uh, you wrote some books. You have a, a a series of books. That that's an ongoing effort. Um, my original. Uh, gambit into the history. In fact, I, I've done a lot of lectures and, and, and presentations around the Valley and a lot of newspaper articles. One of the major articles I had found uh, about 618 hotels in the wow. entire history of Napa County. Nobody could believe that. I was astounded. Yeah. So I kept up my research and I, I review miles and miles of microfilm and with a couple of a bunch of new hotels being added to the inventory, we're now at 741 hotels since 1849 to the present. 741 hotels. Now that includes bed and breakfasts, but we had major resorts that have long been forgotten. And the, the key factor is Napa County has always, from day one, been a major tourist destination area. Wine is very recent. And the vintners don't like hearing that too much. But I say, hey, you've cornered the market and you're branding the whole world. My wife and I travel the world. We, we get to go everywhere. And almost everyone has heard of the Napa Valley, uh, which is pretty amazing. And it's yeah. wine that put us on the map. Yeah. And that wasn't until the 1970s, the judgment of Paris and that sort of thing. But the fact is, um, and, and in my lectures and, and, uh, and uh, charts and graphs, Napa County had more hotel rooms in the 1870s per capita than it does today. Hmm. Pretty wow. astounding. Yeah. You think of all the great resorts now. Right. We had even more back then. We languished for about 30 years after the Great Depression and Prohibition. Uh, we could, held kind of steady, and then we took off after the judgment in Paris and the growth of our newborn. To me, at my age, you know, 30 years is yesterday, so our wine industry is new. And granted, we, you know, you, you talk about Tetzlich, left uh, as a uh, pioneer. Jacob Schramm, the famous Jakob Schramm of Schramsberg wineries, actually started out as the barber at the White Sulphur Springs Hotel. And the White Sulphur Spring Hotel was the first resort in the state of California, 1852. And Schramm would cut hair for a nickel a head and save his money and buy some vineyard land. And ultimately the Schramsberg became an icon. There were a few who believed in the wines, but it wasn't popular. Uh, the phylloxera of the eight, 1890s wiped out, wiped out most of the crop. And then of course, prohibition shut down an awful lot of the business. And what's, what's amazing is people think, well, the entire county must have been devastated by prohibition. Yes, the grape growers and vintners were, most of them, but Napa was a wide open outlaw county and in fact, the hotel industry did not suffer much because uh, people would come in, especially over the weekends, and fill their trunks with bootleg brandy, whiskey, wine, and, uh, and occupy the hotels. A number of the hotels had hidden speakeasies. 
the famous Stag's Leap Man Mansion Hotel had an elaborate uh, hidden room. And it was right next to, in the same room as the U.S. Post Office. So all kinds of felonies were committed. But you go in to pick up your, your mail, and then you knock on the door, and then open the secret passage, and you could drink to your heart's content. Wow. Lots of lots of the wineries sold bricks of wine, which made their way to Chicago. They were further distilled, and uh, prohibition wasn't quite as devastating on Napa County as many people uh, surmise it was. Still heavy, and in fact, one of the most famous Napa characters, Dave Cavagnaro, known as the uh, Godfather of Little Italy on the east side of the Napa River, somehow. And he ran the Brooklyn Hotel. Somehow the day, the very day that Prohibition was repealed in 19, 1933, he had a full stock of 3-2 beer, which he proudly served to everybody in Napa County. They could wow. up forever. But uh, yeah, there's a great history. Major stills were uncovered in downtown Napa. Uh, the sheriffs looked the other way. We had uh, one of the famous hotels up uh between St. Helena and Calistoga was called the uh uh Paradise Hotel. Uh the locals called it the Paro Dice because and in fact it, their their marketing showed a biplane flying in. They'd say fly into Napa for breakfast at the Paradise Hotel resort. And uh upstairs was uh was gaming and uh, fascinating stuff going on there. Wow. Wow. So, you know, you explain such a rich history of Napa that probably none of us really, really know unless you're studying it. But today, when you tell people about Napa, they automatically think wine. So what do you think it is about Napa that makes it great for winemaking? And uh, who were some of the first prominent winemakers in the area? Well, um, for, to, to double all the way back, what I've come to realize is everything about Napa is based on the geology and the climate. We just have such a rare combination. And under geology, I, I include a river, uh, but we have the mountain peaks. Um, we have the volcanic soil, we have the drainage and the Mediterranean climate. And when you talk about first the tourist industry, which dwarfed the wine industry, uh, Think about living in San Francisco in the 1880s when uh, you know Sam Brannan brought his uh, Mormons on the ship Brooklyn and doubled the population of San Francisco overnight. He learned of the gold rush and he owned the only printing press in the entire state of California. 1848, he went up to Sutter's Mill, saw the, and verified there was gold, but he sat on that information. He then scooped up all mining supplies from Sacramento, south of San Francisco. Then he printed 5,000 copies of his newspaper and released it, shipped it uh, around the horn to St. Louis, where it then spread. That's why we're called the 49ers, even though the gold rush was created in 48, Sam Brannan. But Sam Brannan came to Napa and he actually grew grapes, made brandy. He was a serial entrepreneur. Uh, but if you lived in San Francisco in the early days, it was cold, it was foggy, you know, the story about the coldest uh, winter you ever spent was summer in San Francisco. Well, even heading down to Monterey and Carmel in that area, you couldn't trust the weather. And if you came up to Napa, you had a Mediterranean climate all throughout the summer, cool nights and hot, dry. And back in the 1800s, everything was about health. And Napa got to boast because of its geology, the natural springs, we have carbonated springs. And before the state of California in 1922 started cracking down on medical claims that couldn't possibly be true, every resort in Napa said that their particular water or their treatment or their hot spring would cure every conceivable <laughs> malady. I, I have one newspaper <laughs> that says it'll cure, their water will cure scoliosis, which wow. really so the geology made it happen. Those who decided to get involved in agriculture, especially the immigrants who wanted wine for their own families' dinner tables, 
found that this soil was just perfect. But any other crop was also perfect. Um, Napa cabbages. I once grew cabbage in my backyard to see what happened. It was so big that I couldn't put it in my refrigerator. I stopped doing it. It's things wow. just, as you know, wow. grow better in Napa than anywhere. So, yeah, uh, yeah that's uh, the, the soil, the geology from our min, from our vast tourism industry because of the climate and elevation. And, you know, most of the resorts were built up in the uh, Mayakamas range to the west and the Howell Mountain Range to the to the east, and then in the Berryessa Valley and everything uh, to the further east. The climate, and, and you know, if you lived in San Francisco, everything was coal heated. The fumes, the horses, the flies, the cold weather, it was an easy sell to get people up to Napa. And, you know, this is before we had highways. So you didn't want to go to Carmel or Monterey because it was, going to be cold and damp and foggy no no such thing as going to lake tahoe because there's no way to get there the donner party had a hell of a time uh making the rest of the journey so napa um really had those drivers and uh there's no question that the early winery pioneers stumbled on and, and were making some great wine and most of and plus we you know, we had viticulture, but a lot of that was table grapes. I was delighted when I found that uh, the Etna Springs Resort advertised for a grape cure for bad health. And I said, oh, great, finally a mention of wine, since nobody cared about wine in Africa. Well, we, still, we still believe in that. We still <laughs> believe that a glass of wine cures, cures just about everything. And and I think those early settlers did as well. They're the ones who, who really brought, um, you know, table wine uh, to the area. And so, so, so the transition from table wine, if you can kind of talk about those first early years of wine production and distribution, um, what did that look like? How, how was that uh, transition? It, it was basically small vineyards and they would be transported by ferry since there are no bridges down to San Francisco where the ethnic communities uh, purchased it. It was a good market. The real wine industry uh, was created by folks like Robert Mondavi, who was a marketing wizard. And they'd already had the, the uh, you know, if, if your listeners make their way up to Napa, our Goodman Library, the Napa County Historical Society, has a huge documentation on the wine industry. There's not that much from the early years. Uh, there were just a few people doing it. And they did it well, but it was a limited market. You have to remember, most of the population didn't like wine, had no interest. It was hard booze and liquor and beers. Yeah. You know, we had a huge German population in Napa County. They were using the barley and the hops that we grew uh, to produce beers and exporting them. Um, uh, uh, and it, I combed the markets, even the grape cure in the in the early 1900s. When I researched it, it was eating table grapes. It wasn't wine, and I was I, I was totally bummed out about that. I thought, <laughs> man, harvest festival, and, right. and just to complete the loop on our agriculture during during the uh, the uh, 20th century, the 1900s period, it was not wines; it was orchards. We were the fruit capital. We were the prune capital. Every Napa high school kid got off school to earn a couple bucks picking prunes. Oh, wow. Still, vines and vineyards. So that makes it even special. In fact, at the Napa County Historical Society, we give tours of the early the early wineries, and they're very, uh, very rare. And we give tours and have a lot of information on the ghost wineries. And... Uh, so yes, it's a perfect place to grow, grow wines. Not much wine was produced. What was produced was excellent. It got wiped out by phylloxera. Then it got wiped out by prohibition and uh, the, Depre the Great Depression. And uh, then it languished. Not much was happening. It wasn't until Judge of Judgment in Paris where people started recognizing the quality of Napa Valley wineries. So there are people that come to Napa, Napa, there were many people that were born before uh, 
Napa Valley became famous for wines. We like to, as a marketing ploy, suggest we've always been. And that's that's a big stretch. The the fact is we had some good wines, but it was a minimal part of life and the nature and the economic uh, composition of Napa County. Right. So let me ask you this. What surprising fact about Napa? You're talking about this is about the time where people are starting to come and really see that this is uh, we've transitioned from, um, you know, agriculture, um, you know, hotels are starting to come, visitors are starting to come. Um, and now we have Napa, what we know it today. What surprising fact about Napa do most people don't know? Um, I would assume it's kind of what, you know, a lot of what you already mentioned. There was so much there that, that I certainly didn't know. Well, there, there's a yeah, more and more uh, travelers and tourists are looking for experiential um, uh, undertakings where they can learn a lot and get immersed and and come away from their their visit uh, feeling that they're part of it and they understand the part of it. So to recognize the diversity of the types of industries that we support and still support, the fact that um, that our eastern Napa, uh, Lake Berryessa, which will soon be revived, is one of the great resources of the state of California, seventh largest reservoir in the, the state of 40 million people. It was once a major resort area. It's The federal government shut it down, but it's reviving again. So you have water sports, uh, the hiking, the cycling, anybody who cycles looks at the eastern part of Napa and say, this is a destination Mecca for outdoor activities that if you just drive up and down the, the principal valley, Napa Valley uh, proper, you wouldn't know this is there. Uh, we just got an expansion yesterday of, of uh, balloon tours. And when you can see the geology and geography from up high, uh, it's a whole different world. And naturalists, uh, you know, the, one of the most affluent market segments in the United States is bird watchers. It's small, but it's affluent and they travel. We have an incredible uh, assortment of species. We had a visitor here this, this morning to my office and we had, uh, uh, I, I got to tell her in my own backyard here in Napa, we've identified 72 dif different species of birds, but people don't realize we have marshlands. Uh, we have the wetlands, we have the riparian habitats, we have the mountain habitats. Uh, so it's hugely diverse and it's great for nature watching. Uh, many people don't know that mink are na native to Napa. Huh. Wow, you know first, first time I, I hiked and saw one, I said, that's a mink. It must have escaped from some breeding <laughs> ranch in Minnesota. <laughs> then I looked it up and said, no, we have river otters. The beaver are now taking over some of our creeks and rivers. There's there's a beaver dam about a thousand feet away from my office right now that just oh appeared out of nowhere. So there's there's so much more to do in Napa and see, and the history is so varied beyond wine. I mean, just just to experience the wine is enough for most travelers, but we have yeah. the icing and the cake, a rich history on top of all that, that had very little to do with wine. So right. it's a win-win for the, the, the traveler, even the, the day uh, traveler. I, I, I have to tell you, back in 1973, I did an economic feasibility study for a proposed upscale kind of motor hotel. Uh, I was with a, a giant firm and, uh, at first, there was, uh, I couldn't see why anybody would spend the night in Napa County. But the more I looked at sub and tertiary markets, I finally cobbled enough together. And I said, there's enough here to justify a return on investment on a motel. And the partners in my firm, I wasn't a partner yet, said, no, no, nobody would ever spend a dollar to spend the night in Napa County. And in fact, when I did my study, the only brand in the entire County, and if you think we have 156 hotels and B and Bs right now, the only brand in 1973, Motel Six. Whoa! When I say we, when I say we languished 
for a couple of decades. Yeah. Product of the war, product of the Great Depression, after of the of uh, prohibition. Uh, we started recovering in 73, and then we had the judgment in Paris, and some brilliant vintners and winemakers started promoting the heck out of that, and that whole industry launched. And it's kind of fascinating that it's really a symbiotic relationship because now the wine industry takes precedence and is better to market than the lodging industry, but it's totally symbiotic, rare. Everybody talks about symbiosis. This is truly symbiotic. People always came to Napa because they wanted to be in Napa for back then it was health largely and recreation. Now they come primarily because the wineries, but the wineries benefit. We actually house the people who then go to the wineries and buy their wine. For the wineries, that eliminates the middleman. Instead of paying the distributors and the stores and the stockers and the shelves, our hotel lodging industry uh, gets to bring the consumers in, house them, make them comfortable, and then send them out to buy the product directly at the point of manufacture. So the wine industry promotes itself. They promote us a little bit and we promote our access to the wineries and it works perfectly. And it's in fact, you think of all the hundreds of counties in the entire United States don't have a single hotel and obviously no wineries or vineyards or anything we get to uh, benefit from the amazing tax revenues and transient occupancy tax revenues that come in because because of our natural blessing, which all comes about because of our geology and climate. So how many people do you think visit Napa every year? We'll get about 4 million people for this tiny, you know, when you, when you look at the Bay area counties, we're a small County. Yeah. And our population is about 141,000 in the entire county. And yet we'll get 4 million visitors. And uh, of those visitors, we'll get about, get about two, more than $2 billion in spending in our little county tucked away in the North Bay. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Uh, what, when did the, the wine train start? Well, it, um, the wine train is just a fascinating study in community opposition, pivoting to community support. Uh, uh, a, a, a local entrepreneur thought about taking over the railroad tracks. And back in the day when Sam Brannan and Chancellor Hartson, the number one citizen in Napa, decided to create a railroad between Napa and Calistoga. Brandon had created the largest resort in California, uh, Calistoga Hot Springs. They got the railroad built in about nine months, all the way from Napa. And they opened just in time for the grand opening of of the uh, Calistoga Hot Springs Resort and the mine road that brought the mercury down from the Northeast mountains. So you bring the tourists up and then you load the cars with mercury and take it back down. <laughs> so anyway, then that, that, uh, even though we didn't have any bridges, you couldn't, you, know, you had to take ferries across the Carnia, you no know, Benicia or Carnia bridges, no Golden Gate Bridge, no Oakland Bay Bridge. That railroad track, then became used for passengers. You'd take the ferry over, you'd pick it up in Vallejo, and you could take it all the way up to Calistoga. And it became um, a preferred means of transportation. And then the stagecoaches, and then the automobile was invented, but you could then go off to the resorts. No vi- no, no visiting wineries, because that wasn't promoted. Right. And you know, I, I neglected to say, um, Back in 1973, when I did, and by the way, the, the the hotel that I did the positive feasibility study was eventually approved, financed, it moved across the street, across the highway, with now Highway 29. But the partner said, Napa is the kind of place 
where you go up during the day and you get as much free wine as you can and you try and get home. You will never buy it. The hotel I did became the Holiday Inn, became the second brand, is now the Marriott and has succeeded all these years, 47 years since I wow. first got engaged in that product. But the railroad and the wine train, those tracks laid fallow. Finally, the electrical train and the commuter train uh, couldn't compete with the cars. And the automotive industry kind of colluded in shutting down railroads of this type. So you sell more cars. If you have a railroad, you have to have a car. Yeah. So um, that, that that's kind of a sordid part of our history. But eventually the, the railroad shut down. We didn't have it for decades. And then uh, Di Domenico uh, picked it up and said, Be beautiful, we now have tourists coming back. And uh, now we have these things called wineries and some of them are pretty good and we got promoters and stuff. So he said, why don't we have these restored train cars and uh, we'll take them up the valley and it'll be a beautiful experience. We'll serve them a meal, dump them off. They can buy wine, put them back on the train. And the valley went nuts. They said, what a sacrilege, you know, we want to stay small and private and yada, da, da. And it wasn't until about, um, 1989 that we ultimately got approvals and started actually running the trains since then everybody's done an about face and say oh this is a wonderful <laughs> part of it it's like the, the eiffel tower everybody in paris was against the eiffel tower until they no longer were against it right and it becomes an iconic landmark and so our wonderful wine train is uh, is is part of our fabric Absolutely. It's, it's, I think that we've all been on it. We've all enjoyed it. I don't think you go to Napa without getting on the wine train at least once and have that experience. It's, right. uh, it's really a beautiful, incredible experience that, that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the gem, if you will, of the valley and people who come through. And so, you know, with the rise of tourism, um, and, and so many different hotels, uh, if you were to suggest the top hotels and spas that, that you would, um, um, maybe encourage people to to visit or to research what would those be well i'd have to give it uh, from my perspective you know we all know what we like to do best as an historian my number one top favorite is the napa river inn i'm gonna write you know, it down I'm yeah gonna... napa river inn, <laughs> downtown napa one of my closest dearest friends developed it he saved the historic hat mill uh, built in the 1880s on the riverfront when it was mostly uh, manufacturing, glove making, all those industries dumped their refuse into the Napa River and polluted it, uh, granaries, things that could be shipped. Uh, this was a shipping, not, not just a yachting capital, that's how our commerce survived. But anyway, my dear friend uh, took it over, converted it into a hotel, restaurants, you can sit in your, your room with a little balcony overlooking the Napa River, which has now been largely restored. You can walk to everything in downtown Napa, which uh, another thing that most people don't realize, Napa City uh, hosts one of the largest aggregations of Victorian era homes uh, in the West. You just you leave your hotels in downtown Napa, you walk through those neighborhoods, you'd be astounded how beautiful and more and more they're being restored. Mm -hmm. So Go we ahead. are a architectural gem as far as uh, uh, Victorian type housing and a lot of our bed and breakfasts are uh, restored Victorians. So yeah. the Napa River Inn has three restaurants and a uh, and a, a candy shop where I go to get fudge when my wife is not mm -hmm. looking. <laughs> uh, uh, we have entertainment, a uh, nightclub that's now closed, but uh, it's got everything. So because this was a historic preservation that worked and the developer was a close friend, that's my top one. Plus, uh, the developer and his wife are uh, native plant enthusiasts, which I am. We hike every weekend identifying native plants throughout the county and, and beyond. This is a botanical delight right in the river. So there's a walkway by the Celadon restaurant that becomes the most photographed wedding site. Even if your wedding's not being held there, the bride and groom go to this archway at the Napa River Inn to get their photos taken. So it's a delight. And 
most importantly, all your listeners can walk from the Napa River Inn to the Napa County Historical Society on First Street and then sign, look at our stuff, buy our books, buy our, we're just opening a gift shop next week with uh, memorabilia and Napa specific items. And uh, so that's, that's terrific. In uh, an, another hotel, and, and you have to remember, I know them all, I love them all. Yeah. I know the GMs, I know the owners, I know the developers. I don't want to pitch anyone unfairly, <laughs> but the Indian Springs Resort in Calistoga is reasonably priced, beautiful, and to me as an historian, it's on the site of the original Brannan uh, Hot Springs Resort. And it's had an unbelievable uh, history and a terrific uh, team took it over in 1988 and have expanded it and they're doing more and they just made it into a really, and the, one of the primary, primary marks, markets is uh, women groups getting away from their husbands. And <laughs> that's you need to bring that an back. identified <laughs> target, go up to Indian, they have the biggest outdoor uh, natural heated thermal swimming pool uh, in the county in most counties, since most counties don't even have a thermal hot springs. So Indian Springs Resort, which for many years, and that's a story I can give a lecture and have for an hour long, just in the history before it became Indian Springs Resort, it was, it, it was called Pachato's Resort. And when the developer there, Pachato, uh, a, a cleaner and dye maker, uh, took the option to build a resort in that space, he married a woman 19 years old and they headed to New York to raise funds to make it into a, a more developed resort. They got to New York, gave some investment pitches. He dies. She's 19, takes the train all the way, which, which took many days back to uh, Calistoga and then realized she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but she held on and, uh, can, she held on. The son was born. Ultimately, he came into management. They had three natural geysers on the property, and they would uncap them whenever the press corps would come up to cover Napa. So it looks like there's always natural geysers steaming. As soon as they their uh, Model T Fords would round the bend back down, they'd cap them again. Most historians think there were two and I was able to find the research. She actually had three geysers going. Oh, so that's a pretty, um, just, just as something that is really cool. Um, the, the Silverado resort has, uh, it's now become an historic resort. In fact, the owners have asked me to write the history of Silverado resort, and I've taken it all the way back to 1840. The resort didn't actually get acquired till 1955, but it's now old enough to be considered. But our mansion uh, is now 150 years old. Wow. So, but you go to Silverado resort, there's everything. If you're, if you play golf or you play tennis or you play pickleball or you, uh, but we have great food and beverage, uh, wandering the trails. It's a good jump off point. The rooms are large. You can cook in the rooms if you want. You know, a lot of vacationers don't want to cook, but some people do. And it's great for meetings and resorts. So lots of people ask me, I want to bring a group of people up. Well, Silverado Resort is a great place to do that. And it's the beauty is, you know, it's perfectly maintained golf courses, two golf courses. So that's another one. That's uh, awesome. And finally, I would recommend any bed and breakfast in any of our major cities. I mean, they're taken over by people who love being hosts and hostesses, and they've restored these places. Most of them have significant architectural uh, significance. So we, they're everywhere, and you get good value. Um, you know, most people don't want to stay in their uh, hotel room. Uh, so you get a good breakfast, and then you head out and explore. Yanville has some great ones. Yanville started by being, you know, Yanville was the worst place in the North Bay. It was the junk hole. It was shanty town. Wow. It fed on the veterans from the veteran home. Uh, all the gambling, all the drinking, all the red light stuff was fed. It's often been said that Yountville had the highest per capita population of taxi cabs. That was take all the drunks back up to the veterans home. <laughs> um, but 
over time they managed it well and now it is a total gem and one of their marketing ploys to say come up to yamville uh park your car you don't have to drive for as long as you stay because the french laundry is there the other thomas keller restaurants other more reasonably placed restaurants just a beautiful town lots going on lots of retail so but the, the same goes for calistoga calistoga has all these quaint bed and breakfast and the real small non-branded hotels um uh, mrs quast the founder of one of our favorite sm small roman springs up in calistoga just celebrated her hundredth birthday so she's been doing it forever so there's so many opportunities to lodge and once you're ensconced in your own hotel room then you get to pick from about 600 wineries that will go all out with highly trained staffs or just, you know, the Nicolini family. That's the oldest operating in the Eastern. And I love telling people to go there because most people never go to the Eastern part of Napa County. And that's where that is. Yeah. They did uh, bootlegging and moonshining during prohibition and hid, hidden stills up in the mountains uh, during our wildfires recently all our local press was focused on the fact that Nicolini was threatened, but thank goodness it came right up. It destroyed a couple structures and, and, and then we saved the rest of the, you know, his third, fourth, fourth generation family involved in, in operating that. So. Wow. That's how, would you say, how would you say that Napa weathered the fires? I know those were, really devastating to a lot of wineries and um, there was a lot of people that didn't make it through those. So how do you think you guys bounce back? Well, I'm, as you, as you have read, a lot of the uh, buyers of the wines are hotel guests. And when the hotel shut down and the hotel guests stopped coming, that market was there. And for the wine industry, the double whammy was smoke damage to the grapes. Now the vineyards, saved almost everything in the main valley because they don't burn. They, they became the firewall. Unfortunately, the smoke permeated a lot of it. So the price per ton, varietals, everything just going through the floor. That'll only last a year. Uh, the long-term outlook for Napa, notwithstanding other areas of the world becoming more and more competitive, we have a truly unique circumstance and that is our Agricultural Preserve Act guaranteed that Napa would never be overdeveloped. And in fact, when you buy land, if you buy land now, you, you're never gonna make a, a dime. It's so expensive in the Ag Preserve. It becomes hobby wines, uh, rich man's pleasure, that sort of thing. But everybody is continuously improving the environment, um, building magnificent architecturally significant types of wines. It's just getting better and better and it could never be degraded. I'm also on the finance committee of the land trust and we're one of the most successful in the country. Uh, we just acquired another 5,000 acres. So it's just extraordinary how much of Napa land we're able to put under our protective umbrella that can never be misused again. So whereas Silicon Valley, and I used to do hotel studies down there, Silicon Valley used to be just like Napa, nothing but orchards. And they didn't have any land use restrictions. And if you compare aerial photographs of Silicon Valley, if you can, can find a plum tree anywhere in the entire valley, it's not gonna, it's nothing but housing and, and, and software uh, manufacturing places. You look at an aerial of Napa County, and I, I would encourage your listeners to do that. If you're hesitant about, well, Napa's overbuilt or too many people, just do an aerial at Google Earth. You say, wow, it's nothing but wide open country and beautiful vineyards and well-maintained flowers. And, uh, you know, So it's never going to happen to us because we got the, the Ag Preserve Act nothing in the county preserves can be built upon ever again and uh with the land trust we step in and fill in the gaps that you know there there were parcels that you could have 20 acre home sites when when we come in with the land trust you can't even do that so that that's the impetus for 
not uh, block, blocking. It's a barrier to entry for more resorts and hotels, and it's an impetus for existing hotels to keep improving and getting better so they can get uh, repeat visitation. Right. With uh, with with the pandemic going on right now, how is that affecting uh, how is that affecting Napa? And the hotels. All yeah, it, it's crushing us. Uh, more and more restaurants are going out of business. Obviously, the hotels. Uh, yeah. There was a glimmer when we reopened, and we actually recovered more quickly than most parts of the country because a lot of people. I travel internationally. A lot of people who do travel internationally or cross country said, that "With this unknown pandemic, we want to travel locally." So Napa benefited from that. Mm-hmm. Monterey benefited from that. And RV parks benefited from that. Now there's a big spike in RV sales. People are saying, we're so uncertain about this pandemic that we're all, we want to travel, but we're going to do it within our own four walls in a, in a moving car. So we got our hopes up. I, I watched the daily uptick in occupancy and uh, climbing back to rates. And, and then it just got all dashed again and on the restaurant. In fact, uh, for the restaurant, it's so dire for the restaurant uh, industry. I'm I'm on the board of the Salvation Army here. Uh Oh, I think we're having technical difficulties. Is he back, Don? Are you there? We can, or maybe we should start when he comes back. It's going to be hard to pick up from where he left off. Well, he he, he was mentioning, there he is. Hey, we have huh? you. Can you hear us? Can you hear us, Don? I can hear you. Oh, good. Awesome. I'm returning to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you got cut off there for a little bit. Ever since, ever since the wildfires, we're getting periodic uh, power outages. Oh, oh wow. wow. Interesting. Wow. Uh, well, the last thing you were, you were uh, I think you said was uh, you were on the board of the Salvation Army, and that's where you cut out. We've just come up with a fundraiser. You know, uh, we had the pandemic uh, families, we have the homeless, we have the evacuees from the wildfires, we have government programs that were failing. So we were feeding people at, a, at an extraordinary pace all through 2020. I think the number all told is something like 150,000 meals. We raised the money and delivered uh, beyond uh, our imagination and, and our capacity, uh, but we did it. Uh, but we watch restaurants now failing, and some of these restaurants helped us donate leftover, excess, uh, distri- distribution for us. So we have a fundraiser coming up on February 25th, 25th called uh, the Grand Slam, and we have a great partner in the Culinary Institute of America uh, at Copia uh, to promote this thing. And I'll be emceeing that, and we have a fam- Zach Williams, a famous country singer and gospel singer, and a bunch of the team from here, but we're, we're calling it the grand slam because we're raising money to give people vouchers to go to restaurants to Mm. spend there. And it's the grand slam because the restaurant gets to stay in business. The employees get paid. The vendors uh, have a source of business when rest, it's not just the restaurant, it's the people who sell the produce and the supplies and then the homeless and the people in need uh, get a, get, get a nutritious, quality meal. So yeah, uh, one of our famous restaurants, well-regarded restaurants, just announced it was closing forever tomorrow. So just like lots of you um, around here, it's uh, everybody's getting hammered. Here in here in Napa, it's such a vital part of the, the circle of self-support between hotels, wineries, and restaurants. We're trying to ramp up and drive business into these restaurants. Many of the wineries can hang on the hotels are getting their loans renegotiated. The restaurants are usually single entrepreneurs. And and uh, so our focus is on trying to uh, rescue some of them for a while. Well, great, that, great community here. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know that as soon as we can, we'll be the first ones knocking down your guys' door to visit. Absolutely. 
But for anybody else who wants to visit, you know, when the day finally comes and we can start to reopen like normal, how can one visit the Napa Historic Society and what kind of programs are available to teach visitors about the region's history? Well, it, I'm, I'm delighted you asked that because we have just launched under our uh, our fearless leader, Shelley Smith, the best exhibit we've ever had. And the Goodman, the Goodman Library, where we're housed, uh, was built in 1901 as a gift. It's right on First Street, right across from the Archer Hotel. Um, it was used as a library and eventually the Historical Society took it over and we were just crammed full of stuff. When the earthquake hit, uh, we got destroyed. I was there within minutes after the earthquake and I saw our giant stones lying on the sidewalk. We had to catalog everything in at peril to ourselves in our collections, move it out, store it, find new temporary headquarters. That lasted more than two years. But like cleaning houses, we had the opportunity to bring in some artisans to restore it to perfection. And then we could decide exactly how we wanted to recomplect the Goodman Library in Napa County Historical Society. And our executive director, uh, Liz Alessio, who also happens to be vice mayor of, of Napa, and our outgoing president, Scott Sedgley, who's now mayor of Napa, oversaw this incredible reformation of the Historical Society. And then Shelley Smith created this exhibit of who tells the story of Napa and has all the great books explaining Napa, sub-segments of Napa history. So our main uh, showcase room is just lined with ephemera and memorabilia and photographs that nobody's ever seen before. It's just extraordinary. People come in and say, this is the best it's ever been. Uh, since the existence. And so everyone who comes up to visit us will see that. And if one of us is hanging around there, we'll give you a private tour. Oh, yeah. um, we're hungry, but we do do a lot of special events. Obviously the pandemic has slowed us down. We've done a couple of virtual events. Uh, they're well received, but we're amateurs. Um, we just had a sellout for, there was a famous murder in downtown Napa at the Fagiani bar and restaurant and we were oversubscribed we had a couple hundred people that couldn't get in and so we're learning from that sort of stuff but what we like to do best is hold special events with special speakers or i've can i've been the docent for ghost winery tours we have a tour of pope valley which gets huge attention people come from all over the bay area we have the blacksmith shop and etna springs resort a side of napa nobody ever sees we do the luncheons uh, we do a, uh, we could do this virtually. A lot of people have the phone apps. We like to do it live in person. Our, uh, our, our president, Tom Spaulding, especially he's a, a maniac historian and it gives the best ever history of all the historic buildings in downtown Napa. So we publicize it. It all comes through our website, napahistory.org, which is won a bunch of awards. Um, just go to that and you'll see what we're doing. Um, yeah, and you can still come in our in our library. We're twenty percent capacity, but for a library, that's like more people than we usually get in, in, the, in the museum. So, tell your folks, get up here, become a member, put a dollar in the tip cup, because we're uh, we exist on donations. We got incredible staff and a gazillion dedicated volunteers, but to to uh, collect and preserve and communicate the history of Napa County take some dinero and uh, yeah so yeah obviously we're hurting from that as well we uh we have fundraisers at, at absurdly cheap prices we can't even do that anymore and uh, we have history socials where we invite everybody we get wineries to donate wine i like to get everybody a little tanked uh because i sound better <laughs> we all do. Pretty good tour to me. Yeah, that's that's my tour. <laughs> and uh, and then their wallets loosen up, and yeah, uh, our coffers get filled. Yeah, uh, we have a new we have a newsletter. We have a quarterly uh, tidings publication of a specific area in Napa history. Uh, so yeah, there's lots we're doing. And if, if you have a special interest in a building or an era. We have research librarians at very low rates. You just call in, they'll talk to you for free for an hour. Wow. <laughs> I think it is. And then for a real cheap 
price, they'll they'll research whatever your topic is. So, um, yeah, we're we're still trying to be full service, and uh, and our exhibit of our best ever exhibit will. We had a board meeting yesterday. We we're going to remain open with that exhibit until March. All the donors and all the sponsors said, yeah, keep it going. People love it. And so after March, we'll have another one of a photography contest and exhibit of incredibly cool places in Napa, landmark buildings and stuff that nobody knew existed or is threatened. Uh, and it'll be a real uh, panel judged contest and so we get the community activated there. Uh, well, they're they're really fortunate to have you, Don. You're uh, you're really passionate about the history. I've learned just from you know from the last hour so much more about Napa than I ever have, and I've lived here in the Bay Area my entire life. You mentioned that you came. Uh, was it 2000? You arrived. Um, so, as the last question, kind of wrapping up back to you. Uh, what brought you here? And it's, it's, it's very easy to state, you know, based from what you said, why you're staying, but we'd also like to hear why you stay in the area as well. Even then the climate and the quality of life, I saw that it wasn't going to be developed. I love to hike. You know, I spent a lot of time in a suit in downtown office buildings around the world. I said, this nap is not going anywhere. It's going to stay in a pristine uh, situation. I love the climate. And we actually spent so much time here that we sold our San Francisco home in 2010. We said, we're just here for good. We ain't going to leave. And it just keeps getting better because those that are here keep improving it. And uh, everybody's working together. We've got great responsive government and uh, a lot of limitations, responsible businesses. And the future, the future is terrific. So, uh, and I got to tell you with the pandemic, Two things for your listening, your listeners. Uh, uh, home prices are soaring in Napa County right now um, because people are real. One, people want to flee San Francisco for a wide variety of reasons. Two, this Zoom um, phenomenon lets people. You know, I, I have friends that have second homes in Napa and say. Yeah, I, uh, I don't want to commute, and, uh, but I got to be in San Francisco. And now they're finding they can work from Napa. So that's driving driving the prices up as well. So this is going to be a, a good value investment for home buyers. And uh, the Maddox uh, flagship store, I think, needs to take over a major historic building in Dallas. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll, MC, uh, I'll MC your grand opening. And uh, I love that. Up. Help us we would bring love, yeah, we would love that. Well, Don, we we uh, we are so glad you were able to join us today. We um, this information is amazing, and uh, we can't wait to get this out there for people to to uh, to hear. What um, what's the website that uh, our listeners can go to? It's it's real simple. Even I can remember it. it's NapaHistory.org. Oh, nice. You'll be amazed. We even we even uh, have, have a bibliography and and linked of our entire collection, which is massive. So uh, lots of fun, great stuff. Wonderful. Well, I know awesome. that we've learned a lot today and I think our listeners have too. And I encourage all of our listeners to, as soon as they can, head up to Napa, visit the Historical Society, just you know, spend money, buy wine, be happy and enjoy. It sounds like there's so much more than wine. Yeah. So go and find something that you like to do and uh, really enjoy it. And I hope that we can you know, stimu help stimulate the economy once things start to open up a bit. Jamie, I couldn't have said it. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. And we will keep the light on for you at the Historical Society and everywhere in Napa. So we look forward to seeing all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for listening to the Maddox Podcast. Thank you to our producer, Sam Loveman of Painless Podcasts for helping make this podcast possible. We started this podcast so we could share our real estate insights as well as provide our listeners with a chance to get to know the Maddox team. Our goal is to make our clients' real estate sale or purchase as simple as possible, allowing them to sit back while we handle the hard work. To learn more about what we do or to look up resources about the Bay Area communities, visit our website at maddoxrealestate.com 
or give us a call at 510-993-0688.